Hey, mate. Hey, how are you, my man? Let me turn you up. How you doing? Yeah, very good, thanks, very and you? Very good, thanks, and you? Yeah, not too bad. Good stuff, um, man. Good stuff, man. I've got this guy down here with a freaking blower. <laughs> it's the only quiet, quiet, semi-quiet place I can do this. Uh, no worries, um, mate. Maybe if I get my headset. Can you hear it, Hear that? If, if Yeah, I can hear that. If you can get your headset, that would be awesome, please. Let me try that. Thanks, bud. Hello, mate. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Can't complain. Where, where are you guys now? South Africa and England? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. So I'm actually in uh, London, and then Craig is in Aussie. I'm on the oh, Goldie. Okay. How the hell are you guys running a podcast together from two opposite sides of the globe? Jesus. <laughs> it's lots of fun. Yeah. It's nice and early in Oz, as you know. <laughs> yeah, no, no it's 4.30 now for me. Oh, shit. Great, buddy. Yeah, it's awesome. How's LA? Yeah, it's good, man. It's like uh, June gloom. It's um, It's been pretty hot, actually. We spent the day out at the uh, shooting range yesterday, and it was. I got in the car, and it was 46 degrees outside. He was flipping lacquer, wasn't he, eh, at the end ah, of the day? Nice oak, bud. Luckily, we pushed on, buddy. Good work, Yo. man. Tell me about it, bud. It was worth it, eh? Yeah. What a nice guy, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, my man? Uh, Craig, how's it going well, man? How about you, buddy? Yes, I'm pretty darn good, my man. How's your morning been? Yeah, it's been good, bud. Really good. Still, the sun is shining here in London, and and things are good, man. And yourself? Yeah, brilliant, man. I'm really excited to get into today's into today's chat and uh, and introduce our guest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, you know, we chat to this uh, guy called Paul de Gelder, and we actually probably first spoke to Paul about four months ago. And, you know, it's ever since then, it's been a sort of a bit of like back and forth. And finally, we were able, you know, to, we were able to get him on the podcast, which was just amazing. And we're so happy that we managed yeah. to sync up our diaries. So anyway, Paul is, um, he's a plant powered bionic man. Uh, he's a motivational and keynote speaker. I'd say he's a bit of a superhero, but then he's also a humble human being. He is a shark attack survivor and a massive animal lover. Uh, Paul is a human who is basically giving so much back to the world and he's giving back to humans, to animals and to the environment. And we discussed yeah, sure. a lot of like really cool topics in the chat as well, didn't we? Yeah, we got into a variety of amazing things. I mean, Paul really is an amazing guy. Um, we spoke about his rebellious youth um and leading from that he he sort of got into some hip-hop and he actually opened uh, the stage a night for snoop dogg which is pretty amazing yeah um we also got into the military navy clearance divers and his intense fear of sharks and public speaking believe it or not you also got into what it's like um to actually be involved in a shark attack which is just mind-blowing uh, something that very few people, people could obviously ever understand. We um, then delve into the mindset it takes to thrive after a situation that, like that. Um, and obviously then the challenges of you know, learning new things and learning how to deal with not having a hand and a leg anymore and the use of his prosthetics. Um, we also got into the way he's so grateful these days and how he uses gratitude in his life, how he's building a business with, in public speaking and in other things in L.A. And also we get into shark conservation and shark week. So a lot of really interesting topics. Hey? Um, and if we just move on a little bit into a little bit of housekeeping this week, um, just to just to mention it, um, the audio with uh, with. Uh, Paul was pretty good, but there, he was outside on his on his balcony, so there were some sort of ambient noises there. Um, but uh, and and the Skype connection dropped once or twice. But I'm pretty sure the, that'll be uh, you'll be your heart will be pumping when you're listening to the story. So that'll be the least of your worries, hey? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And a couple of other things about uh, our housekeeping, uh, we are firstly going to be testing out a new uh, email campaign 
uh, sort of structure this week. Uh, so uh, my girlfriend uh, really kindly helped us and spent endless amounts of hours last night uh, putting together a new format for it. So we really hope that you enjoy that. If you're not signed up to it, um, please do sign up to it. Uh, we send out uh, some great information on each week's guest. Gives a nice sort of overview of the podcast and you know what we speak about, and then the other cool thing is Friday we are heading to America. <laughs> so we're really excited about that. Um, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. So anyway, one of the things that we obviously chatted about uh, with Paul was his um, shock attack, and you know recovery after that and it resonated quite a bit with uh, me personally uh, when I was 16 I was involved in a really tragic not tragic but like really um, hectic uh, motorbike accident and I was fortunate enough that basically two cars behind me was um, was a guy it was a paramedic and he was just driving home after after his shift <clears throat> and if it wasn't for that guy I kind of like you know probably wouldn't be here today and anyways, I had to sort of recover from this accident and my injuries were, were fairly bad, although I, I think I got away with, with a hell of a lot, like I was super lucky. And I, I don't actually ever recall um, being sort of sad about it or, uh, you know, feeling like I was the victim. And somehow, I don't know what it was, I just had this like fortunate mindset in terms of my recovery and I just think that that really, really helped in, in my recovery process, you know, and uh, it was, as far as I can remember, it was just like pretty positive and let's just get on with life. And I think when you, you know, listen to Paul, I mean, what happened to me was completely minor. Uh, Paul had his arm bitten off and his hamstring bitten off. And then two days later, when he was in hospital, he decided to have his leg amputated and that's just a whole new way of having to sort of uh, redesign your life and things to deal with. And he somehow found this inner strength in him to just sort of overcome any sort of fear that, uh, you know, his life would be completely different and he wouldn't be able to live and it would be bad and all those sort of things. And I, I guess I truly believe as well that that just made the biggest difference in terms of his whole recovery um and he it's it's so crazy when you think about it like this guy is just so positive about life and that this was like probably one of the the best things that that ever happened to him it was quite incredible hey eh, craig yes it's amazing man first of all like you've always been so positive about that kind of thing that happened to you as well man and you know it's just a testament to like how you live your life so that's awesome but like seriously it's it's no small thing to to just kind of get on with stuff and so so well done to you as well but like seriously oh, thanks, it's really man. inspirational um and and so is paul obviously like this guy is like he's i don't know he's got this uh, he's an epitome of just like positivity and perseverance and he's the like least he's got the least sort of victim mentality that i've ever seen and it's, it's just incredible and um, he, and that's kind of, he's a real advocate for that. He's like, you know, there's, there's a lesson in everything that happens in our life. And, you know, you can just decide what, what kind of a lesson will it be? You don't always know necessarily, but you can at least take it as such and work towards just the positive of everything, you know? Um, but I mean, just briefly talking about the shark, the shark attack. I mean, we, we, the way he talks about it, um, is, pretty intense and the recovery that he had to go through he had to actually make the decision himself to have his leg amputated you know they they were trying to save the leg and, and he kind of said you know what guys I just want to get on with this I don't want to live with a lame leg like just take it off I want to move on I mean that's two days after a massive shark attack that's just a testament to this in insane mental strength and um and, you know, he came from a sort of humble beginnings, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. He, he didn't have, he didn't amount to much as in his early years, or at least in his own mind. And there came a time when someone said, this might be your career in the military and something changed in him. And he, he just realized like, you know, I can make something of myself and, 
And ever since then, he's just been like a machine moving towards um, bigger things. Hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. And and the one thing there that that you mentioned, Craig, is the humbleness. And this is a trait which he seems to just always carry with him. You know, and like since the shark attack, you know, he's moved on to to these amazing things. You know, like doing great talks for young kids and uh, cancer sufferers and uh, kids in juvenile jails and just like corporate businesses and you know what I mean he's like a proper motivational speaker and he's but then he's also starting to mingle with you know people that are like celebs and whatnot and you would think that this would kind of change what a person you know like how they become but it hasn't changed him at all you know and it was so cool just chatting to him he's like I'm just a normal guy I have the same issues as you guys um and that humbleness is just so awesome and he's just grateful for everything you know what I mean and and that's what we flip and love about guys like this you know nothing nothing has got to his head and he's still such a great bloke yeah and uh you know he's also got a really good sense of humor about everything which is amazing and you know he just talks about how one of the lessons that he's learned is patience you know just you know using a dustpan and a little broom or putting or doing up your buttons like becomes really tough and he, he he says he gets like infuriated still like so frustrated with it but then he realizes and remembers you know just slow it down this is what it, I have to just I will learn it just like everything else he's done in his life he will learn it will get easier it's just tough in the beginning and he has his, he has a little a little bit of a joke about um, getting in and out of showers but you have to listen to that one so I think this is a really good time to get into the amazing chat with Paul de Gelder and hear what makes it, uh, Paul de Gelder ridiculously human. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Uh, Paul de Gelder, plant-powered, superhero, a bionic man, shark survivor. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today on uh, the Ridiculously Human podcast. Uh, how are you doing, my man? Yeah, no problem, lad. Sounds pretty good, man. Just... Hanging out in LA, trying to get some work done. Um, so many project, projects that, are, that I'm doing, it's, it's hard to stay focused on one and just find the time to, to finish stuff at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, is this like the busiest that you've been? Like you just, you sound like you're busy with so many things and like, how do you, how do you juggle it all? Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of uh, self-inflicted, so I, I'll never complain about it, but uh, <laughs> Just, just moving out to LA, you know, I wanted to make the most of it, um, and I was bouncing to and fro from Australia um, and America for about two years. Um, no home, just living in Airbnbs in whatever city I was, a car in each city, um, and I finally got a place here in LA last October just because the speaking, uh, I stopped taking speaking jobs in Australia so I could just stop. <laughs> and be here and focus on being here and and since I've been doing that I've just really been trying to get all of my fingers in all the pies so that um, I, I can build a home base here and build a business and um, I, I've kind of really gone over the top with that and now I have <laughs> so many things that I'm involved in I, I honestly and, and the thing is I just go and buy I just go and pay a personal assistant but because they're all in the beginning phases, I can't afford to do that. So I'm trying to organize this company and all these other jobs and doing it all myself. Um, but at the same time, it's fun, man. You know, I'll look back on this just like every other uh, high pressure trying time and I'll, I'll laugh about it and think, geez, those were, those were good days. Yeah, for sure. Is there, is there anything that like, what is exciting you the most at the moment? Um, there's so many cool things that I'm getting to do. Um, and probably, you know, not cool stuff for everyone, but just, um, I've invested in a couple of gyms that are being developed in San Diego, which is really cool because I've never done that before. Um, uh, but then other like really cool things that other people appreciate, like Shark Week comes out on the 22nd of July. Uh, so I've got three brand new shows on that. Heaps of really cool stuff that I did. Lots of great messages to share with the world about uh, sharks and conservation, and, and same with the guys and girls that I was working with. So there's that, and and I'm just about to start filming a um, a show this week actually 
uh, that myself and a friend of mine out of New York, John Joseph, who's the lead singer of the Cro-Mags, uh, we developed the whole idea, got a production company involved, and now we start filming um, over the next six weeks um, this, this program that we've created to make a difference to the lives of people that um, – may not have been given a second chance otherwise so that, that's really cool it's you know it's a passion project when we're, we're not making big bucks off it or anything we just wanted to to give back and teach people some of the things that we've learned through the, through lessons over the years so that's another really cool thing something totally out of my comfort zone um you know working as a, a, a partial producer the talent the creator um you know and and having it all brought together it's it's, it's strange having just, you know, an idea, a phone conversation yeah. turns into a real life TV program <laughs> that you're going to be a part of and, and hopefully will change lives. So that's that's another really cool thing I'm looking forward to. I'm a little bit nervous about as well. <laughs> uh, we recently spoke to a guy named Andy Roberts who was in the military in Australia for 30 years and he's also giving back now um, with his story. Um, but he he learned a lot of lessons, you know, in the military. And I guess, you know, you, you probably all in the Navy for in your case as well. And w w I suppose that does that translate into real life? Like you're able to just kind of use those skills in like business and stuff as well. Um, I think some of them, yeah, like the, the normal everyday sort of lessons you learn in the military are things like discipline and working hard and, um, you know, the sacrifice and service and all of those things, even though, you know, I was an infantry soldier and I was a clearance diver. So I wasn't an officer. I wasn't managing people. I wasn't, you know, doing any business. I wasn't learning a, a trade that's transferable to the civilian world. But some of the simple things um, like like being on time and working hard, all those things come through into the real life, especially when you're trying to run your own businesses. Um, so that has definitely helped me. But I think the thing that um, I've learned about myself is that through the military, and I didn't really realize this in the military, I, I, I guess I um, never really thought about it, was this re reward of service. Um, and, you know, that's part of the military. It's you are um, a, a serving member of the military, you're serving your country, uh, and you take great pride in that. But then when I got out of the military, uh, I realized how much that actually meant to me um, to feel like I was doing something special and I was doing something to help other people. And so I transferred that into what I'm doing now. Uh, you know, traveling and speaking was giving me lots of time off. It was giving me lots of money. It was all great. But then what it, it really gave me was the opportunity to have that time off and that money set aside so that I could do things for free uh, as mm. a service. Um, and I've been trying to continue that out here, even though I haven't got the, the big bucks behind me, because the sense of reward that you get out of that, of, of being of service and, and doing things for people that you will never be able to pay you back. Um, and not even expecting that, you know, that is, is a really great sense of reward of giving service. So out here I've started um, talking at the the county jails um, and the law enforcement departments. Next week, I'm, I'm speaking to the SWAT team up in Santa Barbara. Last week, I was speaking at a juvenile detention center to a group of kids that have made some poor choices like I did as well. And the different, only difference is they got caught and I didn't. So mm -hmm. to try and give them an idea of how big the world is and how big life is and the opportunities that they still have in the world um, and, and just seeing the eyes light up. Yeah. And seeing a, a, a little bit of hope in there, you know, that, yeah. that means the world to me. I can imagine. Like I saw in, in your Insta, you had posted that. What what sort of feedback do you get from those guys? Like, you know, do they actually come up and speak to you? And what is it like? Um, I, I got a lot of questions at the end, but they're not really allowed to. They're, they're very um, controlled in environments like that. So we did a little bit of back and forth with question time. Uh, but as soon as that was over, it was like they were getting marched out of the room. Really? Um, very high discipline. But the um, one of the women there that uh, actually reached out to me to uh, go and be a part of their, their uh, detention center program wrote to me uh, twice 
yeah. a day after and a couple of days later and she just said the change from some of those kids is absolutely remarkable there was one of the more obese kids was in in the gym the next day working oh, out oh, and awesome. he, he never even stepped foot in there um and she just said the kids are talking about it you know you really made an impact we can't wait to have you come back uh, so th this is something that I'm going to try and, and continue down the path of moving around, you know, firstly, California, trying to work through the detention centers and the, the jails and the prisons um, and just and just seeing where it leads. Wow. I mean, you you certainly live on the area where your comfort zone and out of your comfort zone, it seems. And, you know, uh, you as far as I understand, one of your first talks was you were invited to speak um, at like a cancer council um, mm. event and um, and you, that actually as far as I understand was quite a scary thing for you which seems strange you know um, yeah. how did how did that go and that was that sort of what kicked the, the speaking gigs off uh, yeah it really did uh, up until that point I had been asked to speak quite a few times at corporate jobs but I always said no uh, because I was just you know I was terrified of two things I was absolutely terrified of sharks and I was absolutely terrified of public speaking um, <laughs> give me give me diving to 120 feet with bombs that I can't even see any day um, over, over that stuff well previously anyway now it doesn't worry me so much yeah. but you know I quit an, an IT course at TAFE because I had to speak in front of the class I was six months in and they made me they said we're speaking every week and I'm like no <laughs> I'm out of here and, and now it's my job you know and yeah. And that was the first step, the talking to you know, 20, 30 kids um, that have had meningococcal, that had cancer, the leukemia and all that sort of stuff and going in there terrified and just making these kids laugh and making them happy and distracting them and giving them um, a story that would just open their minds to the world. And I walked out of that just feeling really quite amazing. And so piece by piece, I slowly started to become part of that speaking world. Uh, and it took a, a very long time for me to get to what I thought was a, a good place with it, um, it a, emotionally, nervously, and also quality-wise, because I had to learn myself over time. And I, you know, initially I thought I was doing quite a good job, and then I, I did a job for a friend of mine, uh, Lane Beachley, who's a very famous female surfer, and yeah. she does a, she's done a lot mm -hmm. of talking. And I spoke at one of her fundraisers and we got together afterwards and I asked for advice. And uh, she said, look, it was great, but my, <laughs> I, I, I knew Rain would, be, would definitely be honest with me, though. And she said, you're just so damn military. You just, this, this happened, this happened shark attack and then I did this <laughs> she's like you got to give more of yourself you know in vulnerability there is strength and I just thought I don't know what that means yeah. you know, I've just <laughs> I've just finished you know, 12 years as a soldier in a Navy dive lab we've been trained to bury that vulnerability down there is <laughs> operable what is this v word you speak of <laughs> so I, I really had to think about that and work out how to do that and give more of myself and so uh, I tried it. I tried to talk more about the the really difficult times, for example, after my leg surgery, after the leg was taken off, um, after the first week after the shark attack, and the state that I went into with the pain medication not working and the agony I was going through, the, the ketamine that I was tripping out on and basically wanting to die and trying to run people through... To not run them through, but actually take them with me on that journey so that they could imagine what it's like to go through that. Um, but then also off the tail end, show them how we as humans are stronger than that. Mm. And, and sort of, you know, you, you can take people on this journey, you can give them the emotional experience if you're quite a good storyteller, but then to make them understand that this isn't just my story. This is something that we can all relate to. This is something that we can all um, learn through and learn that through through. Is he? Oh, guess we. Uh, they 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 actually make us stronger. Yeah. So, sorry, but it just it just stopped there for one second, but um, so when you when you say story, being a good storyteller, like 
I remember listening to you first on Rich Roll and, you know, the, the first bit of it was about you, like obviously talking about your childhood and then the military and, and like, you, I guess you kind of paint this picture in your head of this like really strong, like brave, macho kind of guy. And then you, you know, then you started telling that story about the, the pain you went through and I was wriggling around. I was like, oh, my word, I could feel it. So the storytelling <laughs> definitely, definitely uh, works, that's for sure. Um, so just uh, just to maybe uh, take things uh, back a little bit, um, you know, part of what is really interesting and important about your story is actually, you know, the, the beginning as well. You know, you, you grew up in Australia with, uh, you know, your younger siblings and um, you, your, your dad was a cop and you basically had like a low income family and then you know things sort of were tough from an early on uh, age so do you mind just walking us through that um part of your of your life please um yeah it, you know what you when you're younger you don't really understand that you're you're kind of poor um you just sort of growing up and learning from your parents and watching them and following in their footsteps. And no, my parents were, were great for us. They got us through, they loved us. They put a roof over our head. They put food on the table, even though a lot of the times that food was disgusting. Um, you know, you, you can't, aff- you can't afford filet mignons with six people on a policeman's <laughs> wage. You're eating the brains of a sheep or you're eating their liver or their kidneys and mum could cook some good things she could cook a good chicken pie but she could not cook liver brains or kidneys <laughs> that was like I, I still have nightmares about that stuff um and so you know we didn't have the cool stuff uh, all of our christmas presents were always second hand our clothes were either mum made them or we had second hand school clothes and as you get a little bit older and um, looking good and having the newer stuff becomes cool, even though this is, you know, this 70s and early 80s and <laughs> stuff still wasn't cool back then. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but then you start to feel the pressure of it from the other kids. And so that, that was got harder and harder over time uh, to the point where you hit your young teenage years and it becomes very important. Uh, Plus, you're going through all of the things that um, you do as a teenager with the hormones and try like discovering new things about being a a boy and a young man and growing up and girls and pressures at school. And you have no experience on how to deal with any of that stuff. So you're learning it all for the first time. And some people do okay, and some people have the, um, the great family support where I just didn't, I didn't do well. I couldn't manage it. I didn't know how my parents were, you know, my dad was away a lot. My, my mum was just focused on managing the household and looking, maintaining my, my baby sister who was eight years younger than me and my two younger brothers and sort of just let, put me out on my own as the oldest. So I didn't get a lot of that support. Um, it was just kind of more nagging. And like crying yeah. to my life, you come home and mum's just into you straight away. Yeah. Like, where have you been? What have you been doing? Yeah. Tell me about school. And you just, you just, you push back. Yeah. And so yeah. mixing that with the discipline of going to an all boys Catholic school is just, I just kept pushing back and pushing back yeah. and started doing some things that were not very good for me physically emotionally um you know stealing we didn't have great stuff so i just found a way to steal it i'd go and shoplift and we me and my friends would break into cars and then we started smoking cigarettes we started drinking boxes of wine we started smoking marijuana and it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where dad kicked me out of home Uh, I think I just turned 18 and I was out on my own. Luckily, some friends took me in and it was just a really, really tough time for me. You know, I was doing things. I I was slashing up my arm with an an old hobby knife that I had because it felt like that was the only control I had. You know, I I, I only liked being with my friends away from home. Um, I I hated being at home, the pressure of the household, like my brothers and my sisters and my mum, just everyone, mum and dad were fighting a lot and I just didn't deal with that very well. So I used to to cut my arms just to feel like I had some semblance of control of something. You know, I controlled that pain Uh, and no one really knew about it. I didn't tell anyone. I kept it quite well hidden. Um, But... 
you know what, man, the, the, uh, the shark attack was re- really hard. Um, but I would not go back to those teenage years for anything in the world. Wow. Okay? I, I did not like that period of my life. It was so hard. But you have to look back at that stuff. Like I was just trying to say before, you have to look back on those really hard times and try and get the lesson out of them. Um, for example, when I got kicked out of home and I just continued down the same path, smoking lots and lots of weed, I was on um, unemployment benefits. And I always looked back on that period, you know, age from uh, 18 till about 21 and just think, geez, I, I absolutely wasted all of those years. And I'm so regretful of that. I could have been doing so much more. But now I know that <clears throat> when I got out of hospital, and I was on all of these drugs. I was on Endone and Oxycontin and Gabapentin and Tamazepan and, and self, like self-medicating as much as I wanted. The reason that I could get off all of those drugs in half the time that I was supposed to was because I knew what it was like to live in a fog. And I knew what it was like to be unmotivated and unemotional and just not performing to your peak because I'd already lived it. So knowing what it was like to live like that actually helped me to get off the pain meds. So I don't, now I see that it wasn't a waste. It was a lesson for something that was to come. Hmm. Yeah, it must be so tough for you to see youngsters that are in that fog and you've kind of come through it and you go like, if only you know, you like, could feel the difference. But I guess when you're in that zone, of, in that situation, it's, it's very, obviously people have to go on their own journey. But for you to at least tell them about, look, there is another side to this, and you could use that that energy, that that strength to putting into drugs or whatever it is, into something more positive. Suddenly, your life is like pretty amazing, you know. And so, yeah, yeah it's so worth it, man. So you were yeah. up in Brisbane for a while. You you worked in uh, like sort of some dodgy industries a little bit. You were in a like work for a strip club. You started doing some music and stuff. Tell us a little bit about that side of your journey. Yeah, I am um, so. I- during those tough times, I was living in Canberra, and it was just, it was just shit, to be <laughs> honest. I, I, I hated it. All, all my, all my friends were there, and my family was there, and I love all of them to this day. But it was just far too small for this world that I knew about, you know. That, and that was the problem. I had, I, I was very well read. I read all the time. I knew all about the world and about all these incredible places through David Attenborough and Steve Irwin and Albie Mangle, all of these incredible adventurers. But I was in Canberra. <laughs> and, and I just couldn't see a way out of that. How was I going to be a part of this big world out there? And so I thought just, you know what, I'm going to leave. I'm just going to pack up. And I threw everything into this tiny little car that I bought for $1,000. I had no license for it. And uh, I had a friend, Matt, who was living in Brisbane, and he got me a job working behind a bar in a strip club. So I moved up there and started working there. And that was kind of cool. It was not a, not a very healthy environment. It was just dark all of the time, and you're smoking, and you're surrounded by alcohol and drunk people that just want to see naked girls. So not the healthiest, healthiest of environments, <laughs> but it, it got me out of home, and it got me making better money. And then I, I was living with these guys from America who were involved in, in hip hop. And I grew up on hip hop, I loved it. And so I started making some music with them and that took me on another path. And I was working in a strip club, I was working at nightclubs, I was you know, making music. We opened up for Snoop Dogg in 1998. Wow. And you know, I thought I was on the path to hip hop greatness. <laughs> but you know, not a lot of money in white rappers in Australia in 1998, so. Uh, yeah, all those dreams came crashing down as they sometimes do. Um, and so I was just back to square one. I was actually even lower than square one. Um, oh. In Canberra, at least I, I had a home and I had an income, but I'd quit working at the strip club to focus on music and they wouldn't hire me back. And I was living in a house with no electricity, no oh. running water. We were eating two minute noodles. We had no income, um, just struggling huh. really hard. For, for weeks and weeks and weeks just trying to dig my way out of this hole um, and I've, I finally found a job working behind a bar uh, just in a restaurant and then I settled into that for maybe a year and it just sucked yeah you know I just I just changed I had gone to the the highs of opening up for Snoop Dogg wow. and putting out an album and now I'm working in a bar and it just I, I just was like I, I failed 
Uh, what am I going to do now? I, I, like I started all again. I've done everything that I know how to do, everything that I've been taught. You know, I didn't, I didn't have great mentors in school or at home to teach me about the adult world. So I, I really didn't know what else to do. Um, so I called mum. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. Yeah, yeah mum will always be there. Yeah. So uh, I, just, I called her and both my brothers had joined the army. And so I, I just thought, well, maybe, maybe drastic circumstances call for drastic measures. Yeah. You know, maybe this is what I need to do next. And so just like me, I jumped in head first, didn't <laughs> think too much of it, didn't know anything about the military jobs. I just, I looked at this pamphlet and I, I saw it had something like um, um, Australian Army Assault Pioneer. And I was like, oh my God, that's, <laughs> that sounds like a, a freaking stormtrooper out of Star Wars or something. I'm like, oh, that, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to be an assault pioneer. <laughs> on a pioneer into the wilderness and assault things. Um, turns out that's not what it means. <laughs> and so I just, I just picked the job that I, you know, I thought was um, intrinsic to being in the army. I, I chose being a soldier, and that, you know, it gave me a, a whole new start at life. And the, the best thing was leaving the the psychologist's office after that first psych evaluation and hearing him say good luck on your career and i just thought oh man i'm going to i've got a career mm, yeah I've, i i have never thought i could have like that's what doctors have and lawyers have they've got careers i'm i can have a career in the army i could build on it i just thought yeah that's really cool it sort of inspired me to really take this this next step seriously and it, that just joining the military changed the whole world for me. Yeah, wow. And and so so you went into the the infantry, into the paratroopers. What was that? Which part was yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I joined um, infantry and went through basic training, which was really not fun at all. Uh, and then uh, infantry training for twelve weeks, and then um, got posted to the airborne battalion in Sydney. Yeah. So jumping out of helicopters with a, a big machine gun and rocket launchers and <laughs> running around the bush and the jungle and you know it, 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 oh, some, some of it was really cool some of it was really shit but i got to do some things that i never dreamed of doing i got to go to southeast asia and work with the united nations as a peacekeeper uh, keeper i got to learn how to use so many different types of weapons and i made i made friendships and brotherhoods and it, it gave me a steady paycheck and it m more important than anything else it gave me a sense of pride in myself yeah. which you can never undervalue yeah you know, feeling that sense of pride and purpose and and value is the reason that we can get our asses up out of bed every day so and to have that again was just it's so great do, wow do you, yeah do you yeah, felt do you felt that you had like I don't know, just completely changed as a person? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, my friends back home in Canberra couldn't believe that they actually gave me guns. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that was the, the, the strangest thing for them because they always knew me as the clumsy Paul that would knock over all the glasses and smash them and bump into people playing basketball and fall over and now I've got a machine gun and I'm jumping out of planes. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> It, it was. It really did open my eyes to the world, and to go and work in a third world country as a peacekeeper, and see the way that these people live, changed my perspective on everything. It made me realise how how selfish and how spoiled I I was living in Australia. Even though we were not high income, we still had a roof and food and clean water and education. And a lot of these people didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. And yet they were still happy. Mm -hmm. and they, they got to live in peace. They got to tend their crops. They got to feed their family. They got to be together. And that was all they really needed. And to experience that really gave me an appreciation for just the, the simple things in life. And I think if you can build an appreciation for that and a gratitude for what you have, no matter what it is, and make the most out of that, then you're always going to be happy. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest battles for people in the world now, that struggle for happiness. 
they always feel like they have to do things for themselves. I have to get this better job. I have to get this better car. I have mm. to give my friends, the, my, my family the best. I have to buy my kids this thing and that thing. And it's almost like the more you get, the more complicated you're making life and the further you are from that happiness. But when you take it all away and you break it all down and you're gracious for the simple things that you have in life, that's where the happiness stems from. Totally. Wow. Yeah, Gareth and I were actually talking about this yesterday and today. It's just like it's a badge of honor just to be tired and stressed and busy. Yeah. Uh, and and for what at the end of the day? Were you were you sort of conscious of that shift in yourself at the time, or is this something that you looked at retrospectively? Um, when I when I came home from operations, uh, it, it was there. I it, it was a little dormant. It was it hadn't really seeded into this great appreciation um, that probably came later after nearly dying. Um, it, it just sort of blossomed into this whole scenario in my mind. Um, it, it took me to a, a, another level um, because it, in the army I was still you know, spending my money on drinking with the boys and buying the coolest gadgets and gizmos. And, you know, to a certain point I still do that, but... The difference is now I recognize I don't need it. Mm, um, yeah. I, I don't need these things to be happy. I use them as tools to expand my career. You know, I, I rarely buy anything just for myself. Uh, I'm usually buying it um, camera gear to be more useful on the film set or you know, just little things like that to help me progress in this life that I've chosen, this career that I've chosen. Um, Everything else is just about having amazing experiences so that at, at the, the end of my life, when I, I'm going to go to my deathbed again, it'll be like the first time where I had no regrets. Um, wow. You know, be gracious, give without any expectation of receiving and know that you've done a lot of um, great things in your life and you haven't wasted time. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, if you go to your deathbed and you know that you have done those things you've loved and you've forgiven and you've done good by people and you've seen things in the world, then you're not going to have any regrets. Totally. Yeah. So wow. important, but like what an important message there, you know, and it's this, I mean, I guess a lot of this stems from, you know, obviously what happened to you, which, uh, which was your shark attack, but maybe you can lead into that and just sort of talk a bit about like joining the clearance divers and then, you know, we can go, I guess, into, into the rest of the story from there. I was in 2004 and I was coming up to the end of my contract and I, I just wasn't super fulfilled. Uh, I felt like I, I'd done enough of this soldiering stuff. I was, kind of sick of running around the bush hot and dirty and stinky shitting in a hole and <laughs> sleeping in a hole and it just it just it was the kind it got to the point where it was the same exercises every year and I was just I didn't I, I wasn't interested in progressing up through the ranks um, I just kind of wanted to continue the adventure and so uh, I got a, offered a trip to Iraq um, but four days before I left, they cancelled it, and I just kind of went stuff this. I'm, I'm not happy here. I need I need to do something else, and so I, I realised it's a big military. You know, mm. there's there's always something else you can do, so you just have to be willing to get uncomfortable. And joining the clearance divers, I had to be willing to get really really uncomfortable, uh, and basically push past every limit I thought I had. So I. I prepared myself as much as I could for that. I started running long distances, doing lots of push-ups and chin-ups and physically preparing myself and went into the selection process basically saying they're either going to have to fail me because I'm just stupid or they're going to have to kill me. <laughs> and so with that, you know, I don't care if they kill me, don't care if they die, all I want to do is pass. And I just, I, I put everything I had into it and I passed. And I went on to nine months of clearance diver training and um, became a fully fledged clearance diver in Australia at wow. Team One in Sydney, and that was just a really defining moment. You know, I, I I could never have believed that I would be one of those guys in the military wow. that other people in the military looked up to and went, "Oh my God, those there's there's the clearance divers. Oh, I wonder what they're doing here. Yeah. You know, they got such a they got such a cool job. They get to blow stuff up and go diving and jump out of helicopters, <laughs> and all of a sudden that was me." 
and I just thought that this is really cool. I, I, it taught me, okay, well, the army taught me to, to push past my boundaries. And then the Navy taught me that my boundaries were imaginary and that you can far exceed any limitation that you put on yourself physically, um, mentally, emotionally. Uh, so it, it just propelled me into a whole nother world where I, I felt like I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And I got to have all of these incredible experiences. I'd never dived in my life. I'd never really played with explosives. And then all of a sudden, I'm diving into pitch black water, wow. like not even not even at nighttime, like just mud, where I wow. can't even see the hand in front of my face. And I'm feeling around the murk and the mud, putting together six 500-pound bombs to blow them up to make a, a channel for boats to come into. <laughs> wow. but, you know, like just crazy shit like that. Um, and then you turn up to work one day and your worst nightmare comes to life and you find a shark. It just attached to your body. And it, it's like, it's literally everything you've had nightmares about has come to reality. Yeah. Wow. And you, and you were actually, you were actually petrified of sharks before that. Like when you say worst nightmare, that was one of your Terrifying. actual fears. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. Every time I got in the water, I had sharks on the brain. But, uh, you know, I have jobs to do. Uh, I have missions and tasks. So you put your fears to the back of your mind and you focus on the job and you just get through it. You try not to worry about it. And then, you know, it's almost like I materialized this animal mm. onto my body. And it was a turning point into a, a whole nother life. And, and this was just like a routine kind of training day, wasn't it? You just were out and... It, it wasn't it wasn't a routine training day, but it wasn't we weren't doing anything cool. Okay. You know, it was, well, I was pretending to be an attack swimmer, and um, the research, research and development department were trying to track me with this new equipment they'd created. So it was something new and cool. But as far as my job was concerned, I was just swimming on my back in Sydney Harbour. Um, just you know, nothing special whatsoever. No bombs, no guns. I was just black wetsuit, black fins on the surface of Sydney Harbour, kicking, kicking around and looking all to the world like a big fat injured seal, <laughs> which, which is how I got treated. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so, I mean, obviously, I mean, at this stage, there'd been someone else in the water. Is that right? Um, one of the younger blokes had been in the water before you and then you were like, okay, cool. Like, let me, let me jump in and, and do take over for a while. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I was, um, I was a more senior guy. So we had the the new guy in the water first because it's just how it works. Yeah. Um, new, new guys work harder. So <laughs> I, I just thought, you know what? I'm sitting around here doing nothing. I might as well jump in and have a swim and give him a rest. And so I jumped in, um, and took over. And like four, literally four minutes later, uh, this shark attacked me. So the shark had probably been stalking him for for the good part of 10, 15 minutes, and then. There, here I am, which, and it was lucky because I, I was much bigger than him. If he'd been bitten, he'd probably be dead. Um, and he had, a, he had quite a rough time with that afterwards. So I actually had to sit down with him and, and talk him through and wow. just say, look, it's, it's cool. It doesn't matter. Like, uh, I, I don't care. Just, you know, yeah. <laughs> just, just go on with your career and be happy. You survived. I survived. Everything's great. Wow. wow. So, so, so can you just like walk us through what, like, the actual attack did you feel anything uh, you know what was going through your mind you must have been petrified I, I, I can imagine yeah uh so it grabbed me it came up from underneath me and i was on the surface on my back and it grabbed me by my right hand and the back of my right leg all in the same bite uh and initially it, it didn't hurt when the teeth went in because the teeth are so sharp and they're covered in this um thin gel substance which allows the teeth to glide into flesh very easily so you don't even really feel that oh. it, it's just like razor blades and then you feel the pressure because they have such a, a strong bite force um it wasn't until it started to shake me that the pain kicked in and just imagine you know like a bear trap yeah but a bear trap instead of having maybe five or six big metal jaws on either side you've got a row of 36 razor sharp teeth that are all, all about you know an, an inch long if that Jeez. working in unison on either side of your body um going from side to side mm. 
know, sh- shredding their way into your body until they meet. They just shred all the way through, all through your hand, all through the bones in your hand, all through the flesh of your thigh until they meet and they just rip it all out. Yeah. So not not the funnest experience in the world. Um, it's, it's hard to, that's the closest way that I can get to explaining how painful that is. Um, it's, it's like nothing you can imagine. Wow. But, but you have no choice. It's not like you can stop it. So you're totally helpless. You're a victim. I was just a rag doll in this thing's mouth. So I'm, I'm screaming. I'm in total agony. And I, I'm given to the fact that I'm going to die. Mm. Because it's just there's nothing, no way I can see myself getting out of this. Um, it's just going to tear me to pieces. Uh, my medical training is great. I'm going to bleed out. It's going to get the femoral artery. Another shark's going to smell the blood. That's going to attack me or this one's going to come back. I'm just dead. I'm going to die now. And yeah. so I, I, I gave myself over to that. And like I was saying before, I just thought, you know what, If am I ready for that? And I thought, well, I, you know what, I've lived 10 lives in these 31 years. I've done so much and I have no regrets. Huh. And so I thought, you know what, yeah. You know, by this, by this point, the, the pain was gone. It had already severed all my nerves. Um, and I was just like, all right, I'm good to die. Wow. Let's do it. And then my wetsuit was positively buoyant. The shark wasn't attached to me anymore, holding me down. And so I popped to the surface and realized I wasn't dead. Huh. And I, I saw my safety boat in the distance. And so I started to think, okay, I've got to get out of here before it comes back. I'm still alive. Okay, I don't want to get bitten again. That shit hurts. Let's get out of here. <laughs> so I start, to, I start to swim, but my hand is totally gone. Wow. So nice. my medical training tells me I've got to keep that wound above my heart to stem the bleeding. So I'm swimming along with one with my left hand and my left leg. Uh, I didn't even know if my right leg was kicking. I couldn't even feel it. Jeez. Um, so I, I get to the boat. The guys are coming over to get me. They haul me out of the water uh, and just go straight into first aid to keep me alive. Uh, they, you know, everyone, the, 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 it's testament to the training that we go through. Those guys just all sprung into action. Everyone did exactly what they needed to do to keep me alive. And they kept me alive till the paramedics got there and whisked me off to hospital. Crazy. All right. I mean, that's yeah, unbelievable. Literally just can't even begin to imagine the, the, the kind of stuff that, 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 that did you but so you were under the water and you were, and some of the stuff was literally going on in your mind you just thought it's dragging me down i'm done for that moment i mean literally to to come back from that is literally life changing because you, you had accepted that your life was fulfilled up until that point mm. has that is that something you reflect on now like like i mean not with the, with the cameras not with the podcast like you sometimes sit there and go like this like remember that time like i'm here for something more do you ever like go through that kind of like mental talk um i i did it so much when i was speaking on stage and stuff that it's almost like i don't need to do it now mm-hmm. um it's more like I, i've just programmed my my thought process into already knowing that intrinsically all of the time you know i i've had a second chance um uh, i've faced most people's worst nightmares i don't have anything left to fear I, it doesn't matter now. And I don't, it's not like I go out chasing death or anything like that. People might think that when they see me diving with great white sharks without a cage, but <laughs> it's, it's not about that. It's about um, mitigating the risks as much as possible and learning from the people that do know how to do this because I'm not too afraid to face those things anymore. I, I don't have to hold on to my mortal coil. It's more about living life to the fullest and, and, making the most of a second chance that I've been given at life. Uh, So everything that I do comes into play with that in mind, just automatically. Hmm. Crazy, bud. And and what about like your recovery afterwards? Like, you know, surely you must have been struggling, I don't know, mentally uh, to just deal with what had happened. Yeah, it, it, it was tough, but it wasn't like, it wasn't days of stress and um, and worry and anguish and depression or anything like that. It was, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd have a bad day. Uh, sometimes the pain was too much. And this this is like in hospital all the way through my recovery at home. Sometimes it just sucked. But sometimes you have those days, you know, you, you don't let it ruin your, your life or whatever. You just, you, you just work out what's going wrong. You try and find a way to fix it. And you do your best to put that solution into motion so that you don't have to be in this miserable state 
for the rest of your life. I, I, I didn't want to be depressed. I, I had this amazing life that I'd fought tooth and nail to achieve and I just was not going to give that up just because I, I, I lost my hand and my leg. You know, and, and that was a, a very hard thing to come to terms with. Um, but there wasn't any other choice. You know, I, when I was going through the agony after surgery or I was thinking about not having a leg and a hand or I was in my hospital bed thinking, okay, what do I do? How, how am I going to have this career again? It, it, was, it was so overwhelmingly stressful that I just realized that I needed a solution. So I just didn't give up on that. I thought, okay, I've got a problem. I'm going to be alive for quite some time. I'm not dead. So what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to let myself be depressed and sad and worry about all the things that have gone wrong and could go wrong? Or will I just start planning and preparing my mind and my body for what is to come, what I know I'm going to have to deal with uh, if I want to achieve this impossible dream of going back to work and having that sense of value and purpose again. Um, and so that's what I set out uh, upon doing. And I, I didn't talk to a counsellors. I didn't go to a, a rehabilitation centre or hospital. Um, I, I got onto YouTube and Google and I did research. I looked for the greatest prosthetics i looked for videos of paralympic athletes and what tools they used and and day by day of doing research and building my knowledge the um, the more i realized that I, I i could still do this i could still have a great fulfilling life um if i just kept this positivity of knowing i can achieve more than what i am right now laying in this hospital bed you know be patient um, I, I think that was two, two of the, the biggest lessons was learning patience and perseverance mm. uh, because I, I, I couldn't do things that I could normally do very easily. Even up until yesterday, I was out at the shooting range doing weapons training and my, my right hand was my master hand. And I know intrinsically, like the rifle is almost part of my body. I know exactly what to do to it. I know where to hold it on my body. I know how to cock it and load it and point it and I can shoot instinctively. And now I've got to do it all with my non-master hand. With, and my other hand can't do anything and I've got to shoot with my other eye and just learning it all again. Just you know, And that's that's one of the big things. The other thing yeah. is like learning to use a dustpan and broom, <laughs> right? putting toothpaste on your toothbrush or learning yeah. to write left-handed, learning to tie your shoelaces. Buttons. Yeah, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so having the patience of just getting through that, <laughs> not knowing that you you can do it your mind and your body knows how to do it but you just can't it's so frustrating and infuriating and i have to honestly i have to stop and take a deep breath sometimes just to let go of that frustration and that and that anger and just go it's all right look there's nothing you can do about it just keep practicing you learn how to do it it's just like anything else you got back to work you know you, you did all of these amazing things just relax, take your time. People will help you if you need it, and then you'll learn. So it's, it's a process. <laughs> I guess sometimes when you've been through a tough event, the challenges that you receive aren't always the, ones, the obvious ones. And I guess for you, maybe not being the most patient bloke out there, like it's a big lesson for you. And like with business now and all that, I guess uh, it's helping you just to understand all of that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, very much so. Um, uh, I'm working with civilians as well is very different to working with military. Uh, so I, I have to be patient in different areas of business now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As a, so, but it's it's all part of the journey, and that's what I discovered. It's not about it's not about the end result. It's it's about being a part of the journey and being present through it all, and appreciating the people you come across and the lessons you learn from those people and the lessons you learn from the mistakes that you make along the way. Um, and, and that's kind of something that I like doing. I, I don't mind making mistakes. I don't mind failing because it always gives me a lesson of how I can do things better next time. Yeah. Well, I mean, Paul, you, you certainly have like probably one of the strongest mindsets I've ever sort of, you know, heard someone talk yeah. about. Like it's, it's really, it's really impressive. But, um, just, I mean, we haven't got much time, but I just wanted to find out one thing. Like, uh, do you, you, now you're actually, you know, a big advocate of uh, saving sharks and mm. uh, you also, you know, you also, of animals in general. 
Um, so what, what is it in particular that, uh, that you're working on uh, in regards to saving sharks? Uh, oh, man. Um, the, the big thing, I guess, is Shark Week. And, and people might not really think that Shark Week is intrinsically linked to shark conservation. But Steve, wasn't Steve Irwin intrinsically linked to conservation yeah. in, in animals mm -hmm. and wild places yeah. and things? Just by being a personality, just by teaching people about these animals, just by showing them on television, um, he said something that, that really stuck with me. And he said, if you can make people fall in love with something, then they'll want to protect it. Yeah. So what I do, what, what my biggest role is for conservation is just trying to make people fall in love with these animals. Um, I, I do often work with anyone in the conservation realm that, that needs a favor, that wants me to be the face of a, a, an advertisement or a, you know, just in any way, whatever. Even if it's a beach cleanup, I'll, I go down and do beach cleanups. All right? that, it, it doesn't matter how big or small it is. Sometimes just the, the, the smallest task done over and over again by a lot of people can make the biggest difference. So it, I don't think people need to feel like, oh, yeah, he, he can go and be on Shark Week and show people these amazing animals, but I can't do that. I can't do anything that great. But you can. You just do it over and over and over again. I, I, I clean up rubbish on my dog walk yeah. you know, because no one, else, no one else will do it. Mm. It, it just yeah. it bothers me. So I go down and I get one of the doggy bags and I start filling it full of cigarette butts and stuff like that. And people not, might not expect me to do that you know they see me on tv and think yeah. i might have some illusion of who i am in their head but i'm i'm not i'm just i'm just a dude getting through life and trying to make the the world a better place in small and, and big ways if i can yeah that's so cool man so so awesome that you like remained so grounded you know that's that's such a cool thing to to see for someone that that is like in the spotlight now so much dude i, I am nothing special <laughs> <laughs> i like i i coming coming from where i've come from and the things that i've been through you know uh, i i will never think that i am any bigger or better than anyone else um <laughs> I'm, I'm still a big dummy i still screw things up i still you know you know what you know, people think that diving with sharks is terrifying. <laughs> Try hopping into a shower on one leg. <laughs> <laughs> Every single day. Wow. You know, there's, you, you can do something <laughs> scary like that. Like when you, when you go have a shower, kick up one of your legs. Yeah. And, try, and, and it's a, mine's a bathtub shower. So you got to get over oh, no that way. bathtub. So no try, way. try and get into that bathtub only using one leg. Doing that every single day is far more terrifying than getting in the water with sharks because eventually something's going to happen. I've nearly killed myself so many times and landed flat on my back, my, my neck right next to the railing, you know, an inch to the left. And I'd be, you know, I, am, I am no bigger or better than anyone else. I've got worries that other people don't even have to think about <laughs> yeah that's classic i'm i'm surprised you still got all your front teeth bad because no, <laughs> no, right? i've had a lot of skin come off the body though oh, classic <laughs> cool man at least with a shark attack you're totally unaware that it's going to happen but every day you kind of like oh here we go again <laughs> yeah, exactly you're like laying down the thick towels on the floor and oh man and when you be, and when you travel as much as i do it's always a different shower yeah, of course. <laughs> oh man, it's like a constantly changing obstacle course that you got to get through on one hand and one leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't know. Have you ever thought of like competing in the Paralympics at anything? Has it ever crossed your mind? Yeah, but um, there's. I, I looked at it, but there's really not one thing that I like doing enough that I would do it twice a day every day. Yeah. Um, I thought about swimming. I, I did the Marine Corps Games two years in a row and won all golds and I was beating all the able-bodied people wow. but I just don't like it enough to do it it's just not important to me to go and spend that much time just to get a gold medal you know, yeah. I don't I don't need that. there's plenty of other people that can do that um, I'll stick to my strengths but I I have been talking to a guy that I met recently about becoming part of uh, do you know what skeleton is no so a skeleton, you know what a bobs the bobsled yeah. teams? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. So, so no, skeleton yeah. is skeleton is the one guy <laughs> on one sled with a helmet going head first, yeah. <laughs> faster than where probably supposed to go. 
So I'm talking, oh. it's, it's not actually a <laughs> uh, sport in the Paralympics yet, but this one guy I met is trying to petition it to be part of it. And that is something that I could get down with. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> awesome, but <laughs> classic. Because you can go and do that and then go have a couple of beers. Yeah, you can, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it probably uh, probably helps to have a few beforehand. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, totally. <laughs> you need that courage. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. Cool, man. So, so, but yeah, like we are well aware that um, you know we sort of even overrunning with your time. But uh, how uh, you know how can people sort of get in touch with you and like what else is sort of going on with you right now that you maybe haven't have mentioned before? Um, so. Uh, Shark Week is probably the biggest thing coming up that comes up uh, in a couple of weeks um, this next show we're shooting where we're trying to help these um, ex-convicts and stuff change their lives is going to be pretty cool as well um, but if, the, if people want to come along for the journey then they can jump on the Instagram um, I usually post a lot of stuff on there um, the, I've also just started a, a store called The Shark Shack which is um, the shark stuff around Shark Week becomes so popular. Everyone likes dressing their dogs up and their kids up <laughs> cool. like sharks and you know, life ja doggy life jackets with big fins on the back and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. So um, I, I needed a way to sell my book out here in America as well because the, the, um, the penguin in Australia doesn't sell it. So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll get a whole bunch shipped out to me. I'll start up this little store so people can can actually buy it on there. And because it's me personally, I can I can write notes into it if they want to give it to their family as presents i can mail it anywhere they need so there's that and then it's connected to all all the shark stuff so i just figured why not get all of this cool shark stuff like jewelry and clothes and toys and kids decorations all just put it all in one place so that people who do love sharks and love watching shark week can just get onto this site find all this stuff that's super cheap and, and get it for themselves so yeah jump on the instagram jump on the shark shack store um and YouTube videos as well. Like I'm pretty accessible. Sweet. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good, man. Cool, but well, I just wanted to quickly like say thank you so much for coming on the show. I know, like, um, you know, we we had a bit of back and forth, and like we eventually yeah. sort of managed to to sync it all up, which is awesome. Um, but but thanks for for telling us your story. Um, but most of all, thanks for being like such a such a great human. Actually, like you know, you thank you, mate. You speak the truth. Um, you just come across as, or you are, sorry, just like such a normal guy um, who is just trying to help people, which is awesome. You know what I mean? And, and even doesn't matter like all this sort of limelight that you have now, you still remain super grounded, uh, like a great guy, can have a joke, smiles, laughs about himself. And, and that's what is, being human is all about, you know. So, yeah. so thank you for yeah, that. Thanks, and thanks we, mate. It means a lot. We really appreciate it, man. So thank you so much. No drama. Just briefly from my side, uh, you know, uh, this guy likes to take a challenge and like skeleton, uh, you know, bobsledding, <laughs> um, making people love sharks. These are these are big challenges, and I, I'm like, I'm so inspired to to take more challenges on in my life, and I think that's something that you do for a lot of people, and and that's really inspiring. And uh, so, so thank you for that, and uh, we're so grateful for your time today. Have yourself an awesome day, man. Yeah. You too. Cheers, guys. Thanks Cheers, a lot. Cheers, buddy. Take care, man. And right. have a good day, bud. Yeah, thanks, mate. See, See you later. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. Gotta be quick, so far to go. 